is Lorna and I'm going to be talking to you today about how whales help fight climate change. So I work for a charity called Whale and Dolphin Conservation and this is a global charity that works all around the world protecting whales, dolphins and porpoise. And I'm based in the northeast of Scotland at a visitor centre that we run called the Scottish Dolphin Centre. So here is a map of Scotland and this little yellow star here shows exactly where our visitor centre is located in the northeast, right on the coast. And we're right next to where the River Spey meets the Murray Firth which makes it a really excellent spot for watching wildlife, including lots of dolphins. So that star there shows in the photo exactly where our visitor centre is. And before we start talking about a bit about whales and dolphins, what we can see along our coasts and how exactly they help us, we are going to just briefly touch on what exactly climate change is. So when people talk about climate change, when they talk about the climate, what they mean is what the weather is doing over a really long time. So not day to day or month to month, but over years. So if you think about the Arctic and the Antarctica, they are always really cold year to year. So although it does get a little bit warmer in summer and colder in winter, In general, these areas, the climate is always really cold. And compared to where we live here, we don't get as cold as the Arctic, but we also don't get as warm as the tropics. So the countries, the areas of our Earth along the equator, that generally year to year is always pretty hot. So what is causing climate change is our activities producing lots of carbon dioxide. Now, this is a gas in our atmosphere, in our air, and some carbon dioxide is really good because it makes sure that Earth is nice and warm for all the life, like ourselves, that live here. But too much carbon dioxide ends up trapping too much heat from our sun, and it's starting to make our atmosphere, our Earth, get a lot warmer our climate is getting warmer quicker so this affects us and wildlife in um, a lot of ways but we'll focus on how this is impacting our oceans so because our atmosphere the earth itself is getting warmer that means that our oceans are getting warmer as well when it comes to some whales and dolphins, they they really like living in, some of them like living in water, a very specific temperature. So, for example, there's a whale called the bowhead whale, and they only live in the Arctic in really cold water. And their bodies are well adapted for this. So they grow a really thick layer of fat called blubber under their skin. And this helps protect them from the cold. It helps to keep them warm. And if the cold seas where they live start getting too warm, there won't be any cold seas for them to move to. Now, our oceans also take in a lot of this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So it moves from the atmosphere into the water. And this is causing the water itself to kind of change. So the chemistry of our oceans is changing with more carbon dioxide um, absorbed by them. And this is quite bad for lots of marine life that like to build skeletons and shells because too much carbon dioxide actually causes these shells to start to dissolve almost. And that's quite bad for the creatures that that need those shells to live in and for protection, but also quite bad for the other marine life that feeds on these animals and these creatures too. So climate change is a really big issue, not just for ourselves, but for a lot of the life on Earth, um, including in the oceans. Now, 
Before we look at exactly how whales and dolphins can help us fight climate change, uh, we're going to look a little bit about the types of whales and dolphins that we can see where we live, so around the UK. So you'll see on this slide, there's a lovely map of the UK there, and all these different whales and dolphins that can be seen in our waters throughout the year. So we've got lots of different types of dolphins that we can see. So bottlenose dolphins, we're going to look at a little bit closer. Dolphins like the orca and Rizzo's dolphins. We get one type of porpoise in the UK, and that's the harbour porpoise, and that can be seen all around our coast. And we also get whales such as the minke whale. Now we're going to look at some of these in a bit more detail. Let's first start with the bottlenose dolphin. Now, there are a few populations, groups of bottlenose dolphins around the UK that live here all year round. And on the east coast of Scotland and England, we have a resident population that have about 200 bottlenose dolphins that live here. So they're seen a lot off the east coast of Scotland, where I'm based, but they can also sometimes be seen off the east coast of England as well. And these bottlenose dolphins are very special because not only do they live here all year round, but they're also the biggest bottlenose dolphins in the world. So they grow up to four metres long. And this is almost twice the size of bottlenose dolphins that live elsewhere in the world. So, for example, there are some bottlenose dolphins that live off Florida, but they don't grow as big as the bottlenose dolphins here because the water off Florida is a lot warmer than the waters here around the UK. And as I mentioned before, whales and dolphins need to keep nice and warm. So the bottlenose dolphins that live here grow a nice thick layer of blubber, of fat under their skin, and that helps protect them from our cold seas. So they grow bigger and fatter to keep themselves nice and warm. And they grow almost four metres long. Now that's quite difficult to imagine. So hopefully you have a tape measure on hand. So press pause and measure out almost four metres in length. Okay, so if you're ever at the beach on the coast, it is always really, really good to keep an eye out on the sea, see what you might spot. You never know when you might see some bottlenose dolphins like this photo here. So this is a group of bottlenose dolphins that we see a lot here off the coast of Scotland. Uh, they're a group of boys. And when we watch bottlenose dolphins, we we'll often see them jumping completely out of the water like this. They're very active. So we often see them in groups with friends and families. And yeah, they love jumping out of the water like this. OK, next we'll look at the little harbour porpoise. So this is a species that we can see all around the UK, all year round. Now, all whales, dolphins and porpoise have a very special name. They're all called cetaceans. And the harbour porpoise here is the smallest cetacean that we see in UK waters. So it's smaller than any other whales or dolphins that we might spot around our coast. And they're also very shy as well. And this means it can be quite tricky to spot harbour porpoise. So the sea needs to be really nice and calm, like in this photo here, so that we have a good chance of seeing them when they pass by. And they only grow to almost two metres in length, so about half the size of the bottlenose dolphins. So pick up that tape measure again, press pause, and measure out the length of a harbour porpoise. Okay, next we'll look at the minke whale. So 
So whereas the bottlenose dolphin and the harbour porpoise live around the UK all year round, so this is their home and they don't really travel often anywhere else. They tend to stay here. But whales like the minke whale are a migratory species. So that means they don't stay here all year round. They'll actually spend the summer months here and then they'll travel to a different country and spend the winter somewhere else. And looking at this picture of this minke whale, you'll see on its flipper, he's got this white band, this white mark. And that's very unique to the minke whale. And that's a great way to identify that this individual is actually a minke whale. And they're not the largest of whales, they're quite a small sized whale, but they still do grow pretty big at almost 11 meters long. So one last time, pick up that measuring tape and measure out 11 meters. It might not quite fit in your classroom, you might have to curve it around some chairs and tables, see how you go. All right, so next let's have a little look at how whales and dolphins feed, okay? So they both feed a little bit differently to each other. So our minke whale here has something different inside its mouth that helps it to eat lots and lots of food all in a single gulp. And we call this baleen. So we'll look a bit closer at what exactly these baleen plates are. But the bottlenose dolphin doesn't have baleen in their mouth. They actually have teeth and they have very sharp, quite pointed teeth, canine teeth, that are simply just for grasping hold of fish. So here you can see a lovely bottlenose dolphin. This is a bottlenose dolphin called Keslet. And here she's caught one very large fish for her lunch. And bottlenose dolphins will eat lots of different types of food. It all depends on what time of year it is and what fish there might be about. But in the spring and summer, their absolute favourite is large fish like this salmon. Now, bottlenose dolphins have very good eyesight but they can't always see very far in our oceans because the water can be quite dark or quite murky. So instead of using their eyes to find fish, they actually use sound and a technique that we call echolocation. So dolphins produce a lot of clicking sounds. And I'm gonna show you exactly what this sound sounds like. So, I'll play the sound a couple of times so you get a really good idea of what it sounds like. Here we go. Let's listen again. So you could hear there that really rapid clicking sounds being sent out by the dolphin. And this sound travels really, really far under the water. And when the sound encounters an object like a group of fish, the sound will bounce off them and send an echo back to the dolphin. And they listen for this echo coming back. And from that, they can tell exactly how far away something is, how big it is, the direction that it's traveling in, all from listening to this echo come back to them. And it shows us just how intelligent these dolphins are. So let's have a little look at a video showing a couple of dolphins having caught some very large fish. So that was a very quick video. Let's have one more look at it so we get a really good view.
So you could see there these dolphins having caught their fish. And it's very important when they catch big fish like this that they swallow it down head first. Because bottlenose dolphins don't have teeth for chewing, they just have teeth for grasping. So they're swallowing these fish completely whole. Now whales feed quite differently, so they don't have teeth like the bottlenose dolphin. Instead they have something called baleen, which are these long kind of hairy teeth. So the picture you can see on the left here shows what it looks like inside a whale's mouth, with the top of the jaw at the top of the photo there, and all of these baleen plates that hang down from the top of the mouth. And they grow lots of hair along the edge of these plates so that it creates this big curtain of hair inside the whale's mouth. So when our whale here takes a really big gulp of water with lots and lots of food inside, he'll use his tongue and push all that water out through the baleen hairs. But only the water can escape. Everything else gets trapped inside the whale's mouth. And it means that whales, like the minke whale, can eat a lot of food in one single gulp, rather than catch one fish at a time, like the dolphin. So this next video is of a group of humpback whales that use bubbles to catch fish. So you'll see lots of bubbles floating up to the top of the water, and the whales create these bubbles around a group of fish and it stops the fish from being able to swim away. You will then see the whales come up to the surface with their mouths open to catch all these fish. And if you look closely, you might be able to see the baleen plates falling from the top of the whale's mouth. And as they close their mouths, they push all that water out through those baleen plates. Let's have a little watch. Let's look at it one more time and really watch out as the whales surface for that water being pushed out through the baleen plates and out of their mouth. So what do whales and dolphins then do after they've eaten a lot of food, especially the whales? Well, they poo. And they poo quite a lot. So you can see some of these photos here that show you what it looks like. And I've got another little video. And you'll see that whales really don't mind if they've got an audience of people watching. Let's look at it again just one more time. Now, my 
that it seemed kind of strange that we're talking about will poo, but this poo is very important. Because there are lots of these tiny, tiny plants in the sea called phytoplankton, and these live in the surface of our oceans. And they use this poo to help make themselves food. So this will poo has lots of very important nutrients in it that are important to the phytoplankton. And it acts a bit like fertilizer. So just like farmers will put fertilizer on their crops to help the plants grow, ocean and um, in our oceans, whales are kind of like the gardeners of the sea. So this poo acts as fertilizers to help the plankton, these plants. Now to help us understand this, we've got a whale pump worksheet that hopefully, hopefully you will have in front of you. So press pause again just now and see if you can complete the worksheet either as a group or individually by yourselves and we'll go through the answers in a moment. Okay, let's look at the answers and talk through the whale pump worksheet and how exactly whales helped fight climate change. So, number one, whales feed deep below the surface of the sea. So, different whales and dolphins will dive to different depths, but some of them do dive pretty deep to catch their food. Number two, whales come to the surface to breathe and do gigantic poos. So whales and dolphins are mammals like ourselves, which means they breathe air just like we do. So they have to swim to the surface to take a breath. And whilst they're at the surface, that tends to be where they poo. Number three, tiny plants called phytoplankton use nutrients in whale poo and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to survive. So plants actually make their own foods and nutrients are kind of like the building blocks of food. So to make their own food they need nutrients which is provided by the whale poo and they also need carbon dioxide and as we know because we're creating more carbon dioxide into our atmosphere, our oceans are absorbing more carbon dioxide too. And the phytoplankton are important because they use this carbon dioxide, they take it from the water and they use it to help make their own food. Number four, phytoplankton also produce half of our planet's oxygen. That means that every other breath we take comes from the sea. So when they're making their own food, not only do they take in carbon dioxide, but they give out oxygen. And of course, oxygen is very important to all life on Earth, including ourselves and whales and dolphins. So every other breath you take actually comes, that oxygen comes from the plants in the sea. So number five, this means that nutrients from whale poo are very important for a healthy ocean. And this is how whales help us fight climate change. Because if there are more whales in the sea, that means more whale poo and more nutrients in the ocean for the phytoplankton. And if there's more phytoplankton, that means there'll be more carbon dioxide being removed from our oceans. And that will help the fight against climate change. So protecting whales and dolphins and our oceans is very important, but there are lots of threats to our marine life. So here is a few different pictures. Each one shows a different threat to whales and dolphins in the sea. So take a little moment and see if you can identify what is dangerous in these pictures to whales and dolphins.
Okay, let's have a look at each one. So the first one on the left there is the threat of marine litter. So you see in the picture there, a dolphin's got a bit tangled in what looks like a plastic bag. So when litter ends up in the sea, it causes a really big threat to our marine life because they can get tangled in it. But also some whales and dolphins will mistake bits of litter for food and they eat it by mistake. And that causes a lot of problems because it can get stuck inside their stomach, make them feel really full. And eventually they might stop eating completely. So it's very important to protect whales and dolphins from all these threats. And one of the things that we do to protect whales and dolphins from the threat of marine litter is to carry out as many beach cleans and litter picks as we can. So making sure that any rubbish on our beaches or in our parks or anywhere else doesn't get back into the sea. Because no matter where that litter is, even if it's miles away from the ocean, it will still eventually end up in the sea if it's not put in a bin. And we like to make sure people know exactly how dangerous litter is when it gets into the sea. So we can all do our bit to try and reduce the amount of waste we use so we're not throwing so much away. But also making sure that we toss our rubbish away properly in the proper bins. And hopefully that way less litter will get into the sea. The next picture is called bycatch, a threat called bycatch. And this is when whales and dolphins um, accidentally get caught in nets. So the fishermen don't mean to catch these animals, but anything they catch that isn't what they want to catch is called bycatch. And for whales and dolphins being trapped in a net under the sea, is really really bad because if they're trapped under the sea it means that they can't swim to the surface and breathe. So we try our best to do a lot of work to protect whales and dolphins from this by working with the government and with fishermen so that we can try and minimise, we can try and reduce the amount of whales and dolphins getting caught in nets. And also looking at what food from the sea we are eating and how it's caught can help too. So if you want to find out more about the fish that you eat, uh, it's best to head to Marine Conservation Society's Good Fish Guide. And that will give you more information about the food from the sea on our plates. The last picture here is of disturbance. So sometimes when we're out on the sea, on a boat, on a jet ski, we can accidentally disturb whales and dolphins when they're doing things like feeding or resting. So we might interrupt those activities and stop them from resting as much as they need to or stop them from feeding. And if we produce a lot of noise when we're out in the sea as well, that can stop whales and dolphins being able to hear. So they might not be able to talk to each other very well. And they might not be able to find their food too using echolocation. So it's really important that if we're going to be out on the sea, we know how best to act around whales and dolphins and other marine life. And we here at WDC like to watch out for whales and dolphins from the shore as well, so from the beach. And there are lots of places along our coast, particularly up here in Scotland, that you can stand on the beach and watch for whales and dolphins. And you can see them really well, sometimes even without binoculars. Now there is lots that everybody can do to help protect whales, dolphins and porpoise, as well as our other marine life. So recycling as much as possible is always, always excellent. When we're watching for wildlife, whether it's dolphins or whether it's deer, then making sure we do our best not to disturb them is very important. So keeping a safe distance and keeping nice and quiet and calm will help make sure that we don't disturb them from any important activities like feeding or resting. 
You could also raise money to help protect whales and dolphins too. So you could do a sponsored bake sale or bike ride or a sponsored swim. And any money that people fundraise for us goes straight into the work of our charity, Protecting Whales and Dolphins. And you could also adopt a dolphin with whale and dolphin conservation too. So you adopt, you sponsor a particular dolphin that lives in the sea here. And you'll learn a lot more about their lives and their friends and family. And all the money that people donate through adopting a dolphin goes towards our work to help keep these dolphins and other whales and dolphins completely safe and free. And of course, you could always come visit us at the Scottish Dolphin Centre in Spey Bay if you're ever up visiting the northeast of Scotland um, or on holiday here. We would absolutely love to see you all in person. So thank you all so much for listening to my talk. I really, really hope that you've enjoyed it. I'm going to leave you with this one last little task to think about. So later on this year, world leaders are going to be meeting in Scotland, in Glasgow, to discuss climate change. And now you have learned just how important both whales and dolphins and our oceans are in the fight against climate change. And you know more about the threats that they face. What questions would you ask world leaders about taking action to protect these amazing creatures? Thank <laughs> you.